Grab your Bibles. We're jumping in the Word again. As every week, we are... That's where we're camping, His Word. So grab a Bible. That's where we're going to spend some time this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. You already know that if you've been with us for a while. Um, we're going to keep moving on through. We'll get through into chapter 9 a little bit today. But um, been doing this series on a cross-shaped life. And I hope you've been tracking with us. If you have, you already know that. But if not, you can jump right in, and uh, we'd love for you to come hang out with us. This is not church. This is just me unpacking the Word, diving in here, pulling it out, kind of just taking everything out of the suitcase and showing you God's Word here. And then tonight, we'll talk about it all as we further you know, wrestle through what's unpacked here. And uh, it's always fun to be part of that, be able to hear how God is speaking to people and what God is showing uh, through His Word. And... Um, We'll spend some time praying. You've got things you need prayer about, man. Let us know. Come be part of it. Come pray with us for those things. We want to pray with you. Um, and we mean that. If, if you've been here, you know that. So hit us up. We'll tell you how to find us. We're in Tempe, Arizona. And uh, you can find us online through social media and website and all that good stuff. And uh, we'll tell you how to find us. Also, I haven't mentioned this in a while, but there's a podcast. If you don't like seeing my pretty face, <laughs> excuse me, there's a podcast. You can uh, go there and just listen to things instead. And just it's on Apple, uh, iTunes, and all that stuff. You can find it. Just look for the church name. So, um, anyway, cross shaped life. We, the theme for the whole thing has been from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, where Paul said, For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him. Crucified. So that's what we've been holding on to as we work through it. And today, it's reputation matters. Now, that seems like a duh, but if you back up a minute, a lot of people don't see it that way, and maybe you're one as well that hasn't in the past. Uh, maybe you think reputation that you do have is not accurate. Maybe that's the case in your scenario. I don't know. Maybe uh, you're, you feel like what people think about you is strictly based on gossip. Could be true. I, I don't know. Maybe you think that, that people are only talking about you. Nobody really knows you. And because of that, maybe that's caused you to decide that it doesn't really matter what people think about me. I don't really care what they think about me anyway. Has it made you bitter? Has it made you angry? You know, is that something that's made you frustrated? Has it empowered you towards kind of an inner pride, if you're honest? Does that happen? So here's the question. Does it matter? Does it really matter? What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? Well, that's the main, most important thing. It's what we'll look at today. And I'll go on and tell you that while inner pride, while that kind of like, you know, I'm, I'm good with me, that inner pride self, it may be good in some ways. It might be a good attitude to have in some ways. But I can tell you that it does matter what people think about you. It does matter what people think about you. Not everyone's going to know or believe the truth, but reputation does matter. Now, I'm not talking about your physical appearance. I'm not talking about all those things. I'm talking about your reputation, and it, it does matter. So let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and I'll show you why I say that. Because um, I don't say it. God's Word does. You'll see it here. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Uh, let me read verse 20 here. He says... We take this course so that no one should blame us about this gener generous gift that is being administered by us. For we aim at what is honorable, not only in the Lord's sight, but also in the sight of man. Let me uh, pray. Lord, your word is amazing. I thank you for the privilege, as always, of being able to read it, to share it, to memorize it, Lord, to learn from it, to help others learn from it, that, that we can all see you through it. It's your word. That's the only reason we come to read it. We want to see you. We want to know you. I never want to take that and make it mine. It's not mine. It's your word. So even as I speak it today, Lord, I ask you, uh, forgive me, purge me of sin, Lord, that, that you're uh, blood on the cross covers that, I know, but Lord, I know that we have, I'll speak for myself, that I have failures, and that, that uh, Lord, that I struggle at times, and, and those things, Lord, I know are covered by your blood, but I also know it's important for me to come to you and tell you, look, I want to own this, Lord, that's where I failed. And I pray, God, that you would wipe clean all of those things, that today, even as I open your word, I only hear from you as I, uh, hopefully, Lord, communicate your word in a way that others only hear from you as well. And I pray anyone else who would do the same in confessing their sin before you, be faithful to uh, wipe it clean and speak clearly into their ears. I ask these things in Jesus' name. 
Amen. So, you probably heard the line before your reputation precedes you. Maybe somebody said that about you. Maybe you've seen it in a movie. You probably heard that. Um, for many years, uh, you go back into my past, for many years, I had this real kind of Iron Maiden rock and roll attitude, like the back patch on the tore out blue jean coat with the long shaggy hair. And my attitude was, it doesn't matter what people think. I don't care. No one can judge me. Only God can judge me, which is, by the way, a dangerous thing to say and also true. I always find that funny. Why of all people would you want God to be the one to judge you who can see all things? But anyway, <laughs> side note, you know, that was my attitude. Don't judge me. Only God can do that. And, and, and if you don't like the way that I'm living my life. Hey, it's not yours anyway, so you don't worry about it. You go on, you do your own thing. There was a Charlie Daniels song that used to be kind of an anthem for me called Long-Haired Country Boy. Now, granted, I had long hair, and I lived in Georgia, so it fairly well applied. And uh, I lived my life pretty terrible back then, but some of those lyrics are, people say I'm no good, crazy as a loon, because I get stoned in the morning and drunk in the afternoon. Kind of like my old blue tick hound, I like to lay around in the shade, and I ain't got no money, but I dang sure got it made. And I ain't asking nobody for nothing if I can't get it on my own. And if you don't like the way I'm living, you can leave this long-haired country boy alone. Now, that was my attitude back then. That was, that was my attitude, and I, I, to some degree, wanted my reputation to reflect that, and I, I think it did in some ways. Uh, Ozzy Osbourne once said that no press is bad press. Now that came on the back end of him biting the head off of animals and stuff. You can look that stuff up in your own time if you don't know the story. But, but in any event, he, he got a lot of criticism and he turned around and made it work for him and said bad press, there's no bad press. Now that might be true, but your character will decide if it's true. Your character will decide if it's true. What I mean by that is if you have no concern about who people determine you to be, and that's because that, in fact, is who you are, then, hey, it's true, go with it. But if it's not who you are, it matters what people think. Now, those examples I gave you were, you know, certainly not within a Christian realm, so let's take it into a Christian realm. Here's the thing. Does it matter as a believer what people think about you? Does it matter what they think? We love to say, no, no, it doesn't matter what anybody thinks. But is that true? Is that true? Is that biblical? While it's true that our identity and our worth is in Christ alone, that is definitely true. Our reputation, though, our reputation before others it matters because it displays that our character is in line with Jesus' character. It displays that our character is in line with His character, and that should guide the way we live. I hope you hear that today, and I hope that's something that gets in your head as we look at the Word. I'm not outlining this today. I'm just going to walk through it because it's just Paul's language talking here. It's really plain, self-evident, and clear to read. And I just want you to think, as, you, as we look at this, would you describe yourself this way? The way that he's talking, do you feel like this is the way you would describe yourself? Or would someone else describe you this way? So let me start by pointing out the many characters that are in this little section of text that we're going to look at today. The people, the groups. I'm not going to break them all down because we're going to read through it. But just to point them out quickly, in chapter 8, verse 16, you have Titus mentioned, Paul, when he says, I... Paul mentioned, and you have the Corinthians. That's the you that he's speaking to. So chapter 16, you have Titus, you have Paul, you have the Corinthians. In verse 17, Paul says, our. And that's referring to the people that are traveling with Paul already. In verse 18, he mentions a brother, unnamed. Just a brother will come to him. In verse 18, he mentions also all churches. And that's literally all the churches. Because remember, at this point, that's a new thing. Churches are new. There's not uh, millions of them. So he's referring to them all. In verse 20, he talks about no one person, no one. And the no one, the context of who he's talking about is religious people. Um, No religious person. We'll come to that. Verse 21, he mentions the Lord. That would be Jesus. Verse 21, he also speaks of man. 
That would be all of mankind. Verse 22, he speaks of another brother who is also unnamed and will come to him, a brother. And then in chapter 9, just going to look at the first two verses as well. In verse 2, he mentions the people of Macedonia. That's a specific group of churches in Macedonia. He's referred to them already once. And then the people of uh, Achaia, and that would also be churches or a church, in this case, Corinth in Achaia. So let's lay into this. I know that's a lot of people, but I wanted to point out that Paul is talking to and about and from a lot of people here. So just to get you in advance thinking that way. Verse 16, chapter 8, he says, But thanks be to God who put into the heart of Titus... Uh, Remember now, Paul's mentioned Titus a lot of times. I'm not going to go back into who he is. But the same earnest care I have for you. For he not only accepted our appeal, but being himself very earnest or eager, he's going to you of his own accord. Look look what Paul is saying to the Corinthians. He's saying the thanks here is to God, not thanks to them or anybody. Thank, Thank you, God, for putting it in Titus' heart to love them. That's a big statement. Sometimes we feel like we should just love people because other people do. You know me, I love the Irish people. I've had a heart for the Irish people a long time. It's part of my heritage. Uh, but that doesn't mean you have to love them because I love them. You know, the Bible says we should love our enemies. But you understand what I'm saying here? That it may not be directly a burden of your heart. Africa, you know, that may not be a burden of your heart. Certainly is for some people. Uh, But it's not true that we all should have to have the same level of burden. We underestimate sometimes the importance of asking God for that burden. God, put that burden on my heart because we realize only God can do that. And Paul's looking at Titus and going, man, sincerely, Titus loves these Corinthians, man. He loves them because God must have done that. The same way I love them particularly, so does Titus. And that had to come from God. And Paul's saying, he's not just coming out of respect for me. He's coming to you guys because he's anxious to be with you. That's a big deal. How should that make them feel? How do you think that would make them? How would it make you feel to hear that? You know, it matters that Paul is sending someone to them in sincerity, not just a appointed figure, But somebody like that, it matters even more so that that somebody loves them. Loves them, like genuinely, and he's eager and anxious to be with them, not out of obligation. That matters, guys, that matters. It says something about who he is. Titus, you ever been made to feel like a project? I'm not going to go into details, but I can give plenty of examples of this. Uh, myself being the victim of it, and sometimes being around people and seeing it happen to others where it's not about that person, it's about how that person's going to respond to what it is you're trying to sell. And I mean that in a Christian perspective. I won't go farther than that. But we make projects out of people sometimes in, in the relationships we have, in the family even sometimes, certainly in the church. We, we, we overlook people as people and we make them into this project, this this thing we want to accomplish. Um, maybe sometimes it's we come at them like we're trying to help or attempting to help or attempting to serve, but the fact of the matter is we're just trying to honor some commitment that we may have made or some promise we may have stated or maybe trying to earn respect from other people by, hey, look what I did with this guy or look what I did for this guy. Uh, maybe Those people that we're talking about, maybe they are notorious for that. Like you look at that guy and you know already that's who that guy is. You look at that girl and you already know that's who that is, that they have a self-seeking behavior even when they're doing good things. Listen, reputation matters. It matters. It's like this. The person's thinking, why are you here with me? Why are you here with me? Of all the people, why is it that you are here with me? Why are you helping me? Why are you giving me directions? What's your motive with me? That's 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 wanting to understand your reputation. It matters. And your reputation will always precede you on those things. If you already have a reputation, it's going to come in front of you, and they're already going to be answering those questions, not asking you those questions. So Paul's sending word ahead about Titus. This guy's genuine, man. He loves you dudes. 
So look at verse 18. With him, Paul says, we are also sending the brother who is famous among all the churches for his preaching of the gospel. How about this dude's reputation here? Whoever he is, how about this guy? And before you picture a super evangelist here, before you picture that megastar pastor on that giant stage up there, uh, notice he's not named. He, he doesn't, he's not named. He's definitely well known, clearly, but it's not about him. Paul doesn't even say his name. You know, what does that say about his character? That clearly they know who he's referring to. His reputation precedes him in that just saying that much, you know who Paul's talking. We don't, but they did. You know who Paul's talking about, but we're not going to name his name. You know why? Because it's not about him, and he's cool with that. Man, think about that. wonder how many men or women in the church today, giants, you know, these big legends that get up and speak on huge stages, only the biggest stages for these guys or women, only the biggest crowds, they're, they're super famous. I wonder how many of them, I'm just saying, would travel to serve a church when there is no intent on advertising in advance. No internet promotion, no social media talk about, hey, look who's coming to our church. Uh, no handouts or posters. Uh, no, they don't even have an announcement in the bulletin. Your name is nowhere. I, I, wonder, I wonder how many of them would do that. Who would still go? Maybe you already know how some of those people I'm referring to would react. Maybe you already know the answer to that question. Who, how many of them would go? What does that say about their reputation? The, whatever you're formulating in your mind, you're doing it because of their reputation. Regardless of how great a speaker they are, regardless of how well they communicate the gospel or whatever else, the fact of the matter is their reputation matters. Okay, look what he says in verse 18. And not only that, but this guy, he has been appointed by the churches to travel with us as we carry this act of grace that is being ministered by us for the glory of the Lord himself and to show our goodwill. Notice that the nameless celebrity here, this guy, he's not just going to Corinth to headline a show. He's not going to do a, a major uh, you know, altar call and try to do a, a tent revival and see how many people he can bring into the Corinthian church uh, around his celebrity status and popularity. Not doing that. He's not doing any of that. Uh, he's just part of this, traveling with Paul and with Paul's crew because the churches, probably Jerusalem churches, doesn't say which ones, but probably the Jerusalem churches, appointed him to do it, to go with Paul. And his purpose is not a crusade. His purpose is accountability. So we chose somebody who's recognized among everybody for his reputation. His name doesn't matter, but for his reputation. But we chose him for the purpose of traveling with these guys just to keep them accountable for Paul and his crew, to keep them accountable. This person is chosen in order to guard Paul and Titus's reputation. He's chosen for that purpose. It's a level of accountability. Somebody chosen not by them, not the person Paul picked, not the person Tim, or Titus picked, but the person that the churches picked so that Paul and Titus can, uh, can't be accused of stealing or you know trying to skim off the top or any of that from this gift that they're collecting from all the churches. This was to show that they, had, that they're, they, they were of goodwill and no, no mischievous intent to display that they were pure-hearted. By having this guy come for that purpose. There's no, hey, if you don't trust me, you got a problem here. Paul didn't look back at those churches and say that, neither did Titus. There's no like, hey, get over it. We're doing God's work here. Or I don't care what you think. You know, I, I believe I've proven myself by now. There's no, I don't owe you anything. Don't you realize who I am? I'm Paul. N none of that. None of that. Reputation does matter, and Paul wanted to show that. And notice the ultimate purpose here in that text. Uh, the accountability, it's not ultimately for Paul's reputation. It's not ultimately for Titus's reputation or the Corinthians' reputation or even the church's reputation. Look what he says. It is for the glory of the Lord himself. It's for the glory of Jesus. 
Now, I, you know, no doubt, God's glory is never you know, in question. His glory exists whether we acknowledge it or not. It's never in question. In many ways, though, His reputation lies in the hands of His disciples. Just saying. His glory, you know, being known accurately. His glory is there regardless, but being known accurately, that's the reputation. That's up to the disciples. It's up to us. That's why he said, uh, that's why he challenged them to go make disciples. He put it in their hands. It's about them making his name, his reputation recognized accurately. And that's something that, you know, should matter to all of us. That's something that should matter to all of us. Look at verse 20. He says, We take this course so that no one should blame us about this generous gift that is being administered by us. No no one that would know anything about it, which would be the religious. That that No one's going to call us into question with this gift, this generous gift that's being handled by us. Verse 21. For we aim at what is honorable, not only in the Lord's sight, but also in the sight of man. Huge statement. Blame there, he's saying, you know, that that no one should blame us. Blame is to find fault. Uh, But the text here, the Greek word there, it kind of implies more than just a one incident, one occasion thing. Well, he messed this thing up. It's more than that. It's kind of, it is a specific event that Paul is talking about. We're carrying this large gift. We don't know how much, but some financial gift, we're collecting it and taking it back to Jerusalem. That event is, yes, what he's talking about. But blame here addresses kind of character as a whole. And reputation. Paul's kind of saying that there are extra steps being taken because he doesn't want to become a person of blame. He doesn't want to become a a person of blame. He doesn't want to become considered untrustworthy. Not just for the event, but as his character, period. Reputation matters. They are administering this gift, he says. It's specifically financial. That's a big deal, obviously. It's financial. So they want to be considered honorable with such things. And look what he said, not just with God, but with man also. Reputation matters. This is part of where we tend to drop off, honestly. As believers, this is where we tend to drop. We want God to be happy, sure. We want God to be happy. But hey, look, we're taught not to care what people think. I'm just pleasing God. I don't care what people think. That's what we, we get taught that all the time. I've heard that so many times in my life. Don't worry about what people think. You just please God. Don't worry about it. Clearly, that was not Paul's approach. He did want God to be pleased, but he also wanted man to as well. He says so outright. And why? Because how are you supposed to build trust and develop relationships if you don't care what people think about you? How are you supposed to build trust and develop relationships if you don't care what people think about you? How, listen to me, how will you ever share the gospel if people think you don't care what they think? Do you hear what I'm saying to you? How will you ever share the gospel if you think you, or people think you don't care what they think? Paul said the exact opposite of that. And you may know this passage, but let me read it. 1 Corinthians, we're in 2nd, but back in the first letter he is uh, credited with writing them. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 19, Paul says, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I become as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I become as one under the law, though not myself being under that law that I might win those who are under the law. To those outside of the law, become as one outside the law. Not being outside the law, but uh, the law of God, but under the law of Christ. That I might win those outside the law. Verse 22, to the weak, I become weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I might share with them in its blessings. Paul makes real clear right there, hey, listen, it matters. I want people to hear the gospel. And if that means I need to, uh, my reputation needs to perceive me in a specific way, then I want it to. 
It mattered to Paul what people thought because he wanted the gospel to be heard. Romans 14, verse 13, Paul said, Therefore let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide not to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. So now he's not talking about sharing the gospel outright. He's talking about brothers in the church, and he's saying, It matters to me what they think. I don't want to put a stumbling block. I don't want there to be anything in my life, my reputation, that causes somebody else to stumble. Some behavior that Paul adopts or begins to do or doesn't. There are plenty of people in the Christian world that are anxious to do that one, I'm just saying. And and Paul's saying, I won't do any of it because I don't want it to cause anybody to stumble because why? His reputation mattered. Look at uh, verse 22 back in uh, 2 Corinthians. He says, and with them, with these people he's mentioned thus far, he's saying we're sending our brother. This is another brother whom we have often tested and found earnest in many matters, but who is now more earnest than ever because of his great confidence in you. So besides all these, they're also sending this brother here, our brother here. Again, nameless. But again, the Corinthians obviously knew who this was. Uh, So why send this guy too? Why send him as well? Well, Look how he's described. He's proven earnest in many things. So that's already a high level of reputation right there. But but specifically here, he's linked to them. Notice he says he has great confidence in you. What does that say? And this guy has confidence in them? What does that say about them, first of all? That he's got confidence in them, even though he's apart from them. He believes in them. Is there somebody that can say that about you? Somebody who's apart from you, but but would still say they believe in you, have confidence in you? Look at verse 23. As for Titus, he's my partner and fellow worker. So he's kind of circling back around here for your benefit. And as for our brothers, they are messengers of the churches, these guys that he's mentioned now, the glory of Christ. So give proof before the churches of your love and our boasting about you to these men. These are men of integrity. Their reputation has preceded them. Whether it's Titus, this tested and true brother that he mentioned, uh, this famous brother that he mentioned, the churches, all the churches, all of these people, their reputation precedes them. And Paul is saying, now it's your turn. Now, Corinthians, it is your turn to prove your integrity, to establish your reputation. Now it's your turn. And to prove that Paul's words here have been true. Paul's been talking about it, man. Is it, it's true. It's, it's time for you to prove that. You ever been introduced uh, to someone by a friend, you, you know, some mutual friend that introduces you to them, and you hear the, the line, the all-too-common line, nice to meet you, I've heard a lot about you. You know, <laughs> and usually our response is, I, I hope it was all good, you know, or, or, or something like that. But we also need to make sure that we are, in fact, living up to that. We don't, that's not just a cliche. If they've heard a lot about us and we do hope it's all good, then we need to be living up to whatever was said about us. It's one thing for people to brag about you, okay? It's one thing for them to brag about you. It's another thing to be the same person with everyone at all times so that that bragging never falls flat. Whatever's been said about you is an actual, true model of your character. That's who you are. That's the reputation we want. And look, if I tell you that, man, she's like Christ. Man, she is so like Christ. She is so like Christ. And I'm bragging on her to you. She's so like Christ. Then I'm trusting that if you're around her, you're going to see Jesus. That's what I'm trusting. If you're around her, you're going to see Jesus. Well, Paul said this kind of talk of the Corinthians, and now he's calling them to reflect uh, their, that, this and their actions. And we need to do the same thing, not just allowing certain people to brag about us, but to make sure that we honor that reputation in our actions at all times. Look at verse 1, chapter 9, a couple more verses here, a few, few more, we'll call it done. Now it is... Uh, ESV says superfluous. I can't believe they used that word, but basically means unnecessary for me to write to you about the ministry for the saints. Paul's basically saying it's a waste of time to write to you all again about this offering that we're collecting. We've already talked about it several times. You know all about it. Verse 2, for I know your readiness. I know you're ready for this, of which I have boasted about you to the people of Macedonia. That would be the poor churches that he'd mentioned already, saying that 
Acacia, which is them, these wealthier churches, has been ready since last year. And your zeal has stirred up most of them. So they've been ready to give. Maybe they've been collecting. We don't know, but they, for a year, we're not sure. But they've been ready for a year to give. And Paul's been bragging to others about them. Hey, look, even in Corinth, man, they're excited about giving. Even in Corinth, they're excited about being part of this. Man, these guys in Corinth, you you have family there. They love you. They've been collecting for you guys. So Paul's been boasting on them and saying these kind of things. And look what that reputation, listen to me, this is why it matters. Look what that reputation has done. Your zeal, he said, has stirred up most of them. Look at what that's happening. Why does our reputation matter? Why should we care what people think? Because it moves them to action. It creates desire in them to follow your example. Look, this is why Christ's reputation is in our hands, right? The more we live like Jesus, the more that we look like Jesus, the more that we love like Jesus, the more others are stirred up by our zeal to do the same. Reputation matters. Look at verse 3. But I'm sending the brothers so that our boasting about you might not prove empty. I love this. Hold on, I love this right here in this matter. So that you may be ready as I said you would be. Otherwise, if some Macedonians come with me and find that you're not ready, we'd be humiliated to say nothing of you for being so confident in in them and then they drop the ball. Verse five, he says, so I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to go on ahead to you and arrange in advance for the gift you've promised so that it might be ready as a willing gift, not as an exactation, um, exaction, excuse me. So Paul's kind of bringing all this together and, and he knows they're ready to give and he's been bragging on them for wanting to do it. He knows that others uh, uh, will soon know if what they have been saying about the Corinthians is true because they're either going to come off of it or they're not. He knows all that. But watch this, man. Paul, rather than, you know, try to catch them off guard, try to test them, and see if they're going to actually come through with what they said. Rather than do that, see if they're really ready, rather than do that, risking embarrassing himself and embarrassing them. Instead, Paul sends these men ahead to help them get ready to show that they have integrity. He sends these people ahead to help them honor their word. He sends them ahead, man, to help them with their reputation to make sure it stays true. Man, that's such a great message here. There's nothing bad about helping people keep their reputation. It doesn't have to be put to the test to see if it's weak or to see if they're a true failure or to see, you know, there's no cause for that. They lose none of their integrity by accepting help with keeping their word. Listen to me and say that again. They lose none of their integrity by accepting help with keeping their word. Guys, this is the core of loving accountability. That's what it means to have loving accountability, somebody to help you keep your word. We should always look to encourage brothers and sisters, man, always, and help them honor their word. That ought to be what we're doing, to be faithful to the reputation they have as believers in Christ. That's what we should be doing as family. Too often Christians are circling like buzzards, just waiting on a death so there can be an I told you so, or pick up the pieces that we want and leave the rest to die. It's wrong, man. So let me close up. How do we practically respond to this? How do we practically? Let me give you a couple of things. First of all, consider what people think about you. Hold on. Consider what people think about you for a minute. And as a Christian, then what might they think about Christ? Hear me? Consider what people think about you, and then as a Christian, what might they think about Christ? And guess what? Make changes. Make changes. I can't be more blunt than that. Uh, Another thing, is there somebody you need to clear up your past with so you can start working on building your reputation? Is there somebody from your past that you need to clear something up that you can start building your reputation, or somebody from your present that you need to deal with so that you can start building up your reputation. Another thing, 
Stop stressing about pleasing people. Uh, reputation doesn't have to please people. Don't stress about trying to please people, but make sure your actions do please God. Make sure your actions do please God, and then He will become your reputation before other people, all right? A couple more. Find out and use accountability in your life. Find a person to be accountability for you. Find somebody. Empower somebody else to suggest somebody. Find accountability in your life. And then last, I would say brag. You know what? On others, not you. Brag on others, man. Be in the habit of bragging on fellow believers that you know are genuine, that you can really, you know, just love on in terms of what you say about them. Build their reputation. Maybe you feel like uh, everybody thinks they know you, but they don't. You know, maybe you feel like everybody has an opinion about you, but it's all just gossip. Maybe you hear me talking and you're like, man, I hear all this Jesus talk, but people don't really know me. People don't really listen to me. Maybe you feel alone. Maybe you feel angry. Maybe you feel frustrated. Maybe you feel like nobody cares at all. I can tell you right now, Jesus cares. I know for a fact Jesus knows you, the real you. He knows you better than you know you, all of you. And he has an opinion about you that's not based on gossip. It's based on reality. You want to know what that opinion is? He loves you. He loves you. His word says so. Just like you are, he loves you. Broken, angry, bitter, frustrated, liar, cheater, fraud. I don't know. Whatever it is, he loves you just like that. But he loves you enough not to leave you like that. That's what the cross is about. You have the opportunity today for his reputation to become your reputation. All you got to do is hand him what you know to be sin in your life. Jesus, this is my failure. I I can't do this. I know I'm a sinner. Let him have it. Tell him you want him to be Lord. Tell him you trust him and you want to follow him with your life. Get around people that will walk you through what it means to be a disciple. Hit us up. We'll tell you. Uh, and listen, we want to pray for you. We want to pray with you. I'm going to pray right now. Lord, I love you. Your word is awesome. Thank you, as always, for the privilege of being in it. Pray for anybody that uh, has today turned their life uh, towards you, that they've maybe said to you, Lord, they want their life to belong to you. Lord, take them into your arms, love them, hug them, lead them into your word and into people who love you as well and will help them grow. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.